Hello, Seahawks fans. Welcome to Real Hawk Talk with uh, Brian Nemhauser, your host, um, and Nathan Ernst, who is uh, joining us tonight on the Hawk Blogger team, um, able to take a little bit of time away from his holiday weekend, as I know all of you are. So uh, welcome, Nathan. Always good to have you. Hey. Uh, we were hoping to have Jeff Simmons, but Jeff uh, has a life, unlike us, and uh, actually is... Uh, got some late plans with friends and family, so we're happy for him tonight. Um, and you know, we're going to focus a little bit on um, uh, all the amazing moves that have been going on with the Seahawks since we last spoke with all of you. Some of them surprising, some of them not. Uh, some of them controversial, some of them not. And uh, you know, we're also going to take the opportunity to get into some of your questions and um, hear from you. So. Uh, folks that are um, joined uh, as part of the Hawk Blogger Insider, Hawk Blogger Patron pr Program. Um, some of you are on the show with us, and uh, not everyone can see you, but we can. And uh, we'll go to your questions first. Um, we're going to start by Nathan and I discussing a few things off the top. We've got a bunch of stuff to get through, and uh, then we'll hit a bunch of questions. So we're going to go all the way from um, talking about the big news around Sheldon Richardson, um, we'll talk about uh, the most surprising cuts, the most surprising keeps, uh, my conversation with Richard Sherman that uh, got a lot of national attention, um, as well as uh, you know some of the other trades, Cassius Marsh, um, Justin Coleman, Isaiah Battle. We'll talk about it all and uh, get to your questions as well. Um, before we do, I just want to uh, welcome a new sponsor to the show. So. Um, a friend of mine, someone I've worked with before, someone I consider a, a friend, um, uh, works, his name's John, John Hurlbutt, and um, he uh, is part of a group called Altitude Homes, and uh, they've joined us as a sponsor. Um, Altitude is great. They work in, um, in South King, Pierce, and Thurston counties, uh, and one of the really cool things that they are doing is for every... Um, uh, for every closed transaction they get through um, this partnership, they're going to donate an additional $500 to Ben's Fund. So for folks that have been following for a while, you know that uh, hawkblogger.com, we donate our proceeds uh, to Ben's Fund, donated over $60,000 up until now, um, hoping to get over $20,000 this year uh, with all of your help. And uh, uh, John and Altitude joined us through Patreon. So patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash hawkblogger, where you can sign up. Um, and they're doing great work. Uh, I would suggest you reach out. The way to get a hold of John is two ways. One, you can go to altitude, A-L-T-I-T-U-D-E dash R-E dot com slash H-B. I'll do that again. Altitude dash R-E dot com slash hb for hawk blogger and again they will donate five hundred dollars to ben's fund for every closed transaction that comes through this so really great john you know i have to admit nathan i don't know how if you've bought a home i don't know if that's a, your home that you're in but um having somebody that you can trust uh help you through that process whether you're selling it or buying it you never quite know if they're in it for you or in it for them john's a solid person uh, someone i would trust um, someone i'd recommend so it's a, it's a doubly nice thing to be able to get him on, and, and thank you for sponsoring the show. So, uh, all right. With all that aside, Nathan. Nathan. What's up? A lot is going on, dude. Uh, let's, let's start with the biggest news, and um, there's no doubt what the biggest news is. It is that the Seahawks acquired Sheldon Richardson in a trade from the New York Jets for Jermaine Curse. Um, and the additional parts of that trade were essentially Jermaine Curse and a second round pick for the Seahawks next year in exchange for Sheldon Richardson and a seventh round pick from the Jets. So let's start with your instant reaction um, when you first heard about that deal. What was going through your head? Uh, so maybe my favorite thing about this, and it's the way it was initially reported to you, is that uh, people keep talking about it as Sheldon Richardson was traded for Jermaine Curse, uh, and like the th the second pick is a, a throw in or something. So uh, I love that we were able to to flip Jermaine Curse for uh, Sheldon. Uh, <laughs> but 
I mean, uh, it's hard to, to, to think of a downside here. I mean, Sheldon's a bit of a malcontent, I guess. He has that rep in, in New York, but he's a crazy good player, and he, uh, he slots in so perfectly with this defensive line. Um, it's already stacked, and, uh, but the one weakness that it had was interior pressure, and now you don't have that weakness anymore, right? So, you know, you're looking at a nickel package of – Sheldon Richardson, Michael Bennett, Frank Clark, and Cliff Avril. And I don't know how many teams can do better than that. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, if Floor, it, it wasn't surprising because I had some idea that it might be coming. I thought there was a lot of signs, um, you know, um, from a lot of different angles, but, uh, Anytime a deal of this magnitude is being discussed, uh, the chances of it going through, even if both teams want it to work, is less than 50-50. There's just so many variables. You know, there's the player, there's the money, there's, um, you know, the, the draft picks and whether you can afford to do that. There's salary cap. There's just so many things. There's other people. Once it made the news, Mike Garafalo, who's on this show, talking about this potential move. Um, so those of you who've been watching Real Hawk Talk have been all over this because we've been talking about the Sheldon trade before anybody else. Not saying that it, you know, we broke the story, but we absolutely were keeping it alive before others. And so, um, you know, it's been, it's been a, a great opportunity to kind of see this start to come together. And one of the reasons um, I was really excited about it is, Look, compare this to other trades that, that John Schneider has made. And uh, I'm talking about some of the other big name trades. In those trades, you are getting a skill player. You are getting a small or you are getting someone who really was dependent on somebody else to make them successful. And I'm talking about guys like Percy Harvin. I'm talking about guys like Jimmy Graham. And you also gave up first round picks in both of those deals. In this deal, you give up a second round pick, you get a guy back in Sheldon Richardson who depends on nobody to make his impact. Every single snap that he's in there, his job is to create chaos. And I think he's shown uh, over his career that he's one of the best players in the league at doing that. One of the questions I have for you, Nathan, is, um, you know, do you, where do you think Sheldon Richardson ranks um, along that defensive line for the Seahawks. Is he the best player on that defensive line? Uh, I don't know. I'd say that. Um, he's in that conversation. Uh, we'll see if Michael Bennett can keep doing what Michael Bennett's been doing for years now. Um, uh, and we'll see what kind of a step forward Frank Clark takes. Uh, and I think uh, Avril is kind of criminally underrated. Uh, so I don't know... The other thing that's tough about it is he's just different than those guys. You know, him and Bennett are maybe the, the most similar, but they're, they're, they're different players. Um, he's obviously, you know, a, a completely different guy from someone like Cliff, right? So how you say he's better than those guys, I don't know. Um, I think he's that, that tier, right? I mean, I don't know that anyone is clearly better than him uh, on the line. And again, just the way he fits with all those guys, you can put all of those guys in the field and you're not doing anything weird. You're just playing four kick-ass defensive linemen. And so uh, he's right up there and he just fits so good with them. Well, you know, I mean, one of the things you have to look at with Sheldon Richardson is this guy is 26. Um, and when you talk about, um, when you talk about Cliff Averill and you talk about Michael Bennett, Mm -hmm. You're talking about guys that are over 30. In fact, um, latest, I'm looking here at five-year roster outlook up on hawkblogger.com, just double-checking because it's got everybody's age. Um, it's got their contract status. Um, and Averill's 31. Bennett is 31, right? So these guys are have been on kind of identical situations. Um, Averill had a great year last year, 11 and a half sacks, Pro Bowl. Michael Bennett didn't. Um, he had some injuries for the one of the first times. He had five and a half sacks. I really, really hope that what I've kind of observed in training camp and during preseason was was just uh, him taking it easy. But he looks a little bit slower than he has and looks a little bit less disruptive. And this Seahawks defense has been incredibly reliant on his disruption because, as you said, 
they don't have many other guys that can cause interior pressure. And part of their success in 2013, when they won the Super Bowl, it wasn't just that they had a good pass rush. Everyone simplifies it to that. It's not just that. It was that they were able to create interior chaos with Clinton McDonald and Michael Bennett on the inside and having guys on the outside with guys like Cliff Averill, like Chris Clemens. Um, they had a combination going there. And it's that interior pressure that really messes with quick passing games and people that rely on those short passes, like a Tom Brady, like a Peyton Manning. So, um, you know, I think that Sheldon Richardson, not only, I would argue he is the best player on that line. Um, I think you, you know, Frank Clark may be coming quickly and, and we'll see what he does this year. But, uh, you know, we, we could have just added our best player on the front four. And even if he's not the best, he's certainly near it. So really, um, really, really uh, excited to see that change. Now, so when ahead. you talk about five-year projection, though, you know, how, how they keep Richardson around for five years, this is where Evan would be, you know, he, he could probably chime in here, but uh, uh, how they make that work, he's not going to be cheap, right? Uh, and so the, what you have to do to keep him, um, that might be a little painful, you know, talking about how this is a, a low downside move. Um, they're probably going to have to do something, right? You, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't come free. Uh, so how they fit that in is going to be interesting. Yeah. I, so would you be in favor? I mean, this is sight unseen with the team, mm -hmm. um, you know, of a situation where they decide to, to keep him around. Um, and, and they pay him, I've seen numbers like 18 million a year, um, as what it might cost to keep someone like him around in his prime, uh, young pro bowl defensive lineman. Um, let's assume for a second that doing that means no Jimmy Graham. Um, it means no Cliff Averill. Um, you, you can cut Cliff Averill next year and get seven plus $7 million in cap. Um, Basically, what you'd be doing is signaling that this is the next generation of your, you know, core of your defensive line. I think you'd have to do it around him and do it around Frank Clark, as well as guys like Nas Jones and and uh, Jaron Reed. What what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's sight and scene, um, and uh, I don't have all the defensive line numbers. I don't know what like eighteen million dollars. Talking about quarterback money. Uh, and, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Sheldon Richardson is a guy, he's coming off a one and a half sack year. So I'm excited about this. He's a really good player. $18 million is a whole bunch of money. Uh, so he would need to, I think, to prove that, to earn that, uh, obviously. Um, but it's not out of the question either. And you have places like Jimmy Graham or, you know, some other guys that you could move on from and it would it would suck, but you know, these are guys that are older and stuff and you gotta, you know, welcome in that new generation. So it's, it's, you know, possible, uh, $18 million makes me a little skittish. Uh, but I guess it's not my money. <laughs> I don't have to manage the cap. That's John Schneider's problem, I guess. That's right. And the cap's going up that, that number, by the way, came from Jason uh, Fitzgerald over at over the cap.com. He wrote a nice article about the Richardson move. He's just putting a you know uh, a thumb in the air, so to speak, um, about what what it might cost to keep someone like him next year, or what his his going rate might be, and um, there aren't Pro Bowl level mid twenties defensive linemen that go on the market. That just doesn't happen, quite honestly. Those guys are always kept. You know, there's some talk you franchise them. I don't think they're going to do that. Um, they could, but. I actually, this is just a theory. I don't have a source on this, but my guess would be that that this is especially a conditional second round pick. My guess is maybe it's a third conditional on them keeping him. And if it, if they keep him, it might move to a second. So we'll see. Um, we'll see how that plays out, but uh, um, just a huge, huge impact. And uh, we'll have a lot more to talk about with Sheldon Richardson along the way. Any thoughts, parting thoughts with Jermaine Curse uh, on his way out? I know that uh, he's he's someone that you're very fond of. Yeah, he was a favorite of mine. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, uh, I guess I wish he would have gone to a better place. <laughs> that Jets team is such a disaster. Sounds like uh, he died, dude. Uh, you know, he might. I mean, who knows what's going to happen on that team? It's <laughs> awful. Uh, no, he'll be fine. But, uh, yeah, I, I guess I just wish he'd gone somewhere that I could have, you know, 
hopefully enjoy to play more. Uh, but when you're flipping a guy like, you know, Jermaine Kers for Sheldon Richardson, uh, because that was a straight up deal for those two and the second round pick was just a throw in, uh, you know, you, you, you pull that trigger every time. So not too sad about it. Wish he would have gone somewhere um, where he probably could have had a little bit more fun, but he'll be all right. Yeah, well, he'll definitely get a lot of um, run in New York. Um, I, I was joking with Mina Kimes that uh, I wish she, I think she used to live in New York, and I wish she was still there to help protect him from the media out there. I think he's, he's going to be a lot more danger from the media than he is going to be from anything that happens on the field. It could get ugly, especially if he has another year like last year, uh, where, you know, I love the guy, but he was not great. Uh, that could get real ugly real fast. Yeah, he, he he's he's such a nice guy and a good mm-hmm. guy, and uh, that does not necessarily play well in New York. Uh, you know uh, that that town can shred people. So, um, you know, I, I think it's worth just remembering what kind of contributions he's made. Um, I won't go through them all. I mean, the Seahawks did a nice little cut up on him and and what he's capable of and what he con- contributed to the team and the franchise. I would just say that. I can't think of any other player, not one, that has made more significant plays for this franchise than Jermaine Curse. And I don't say that lightly. I mean, I, I literally I boggle my – like, I try to, like, think through. But, I mean, the guy made two Super Bowl entry – you know, and getting us to the Super Bowl catches. Um, he's made two huge catches in each of those Super Bowls. Countless other times he's made big plays um, in the regular season when it counted. Um, so, yeah, I, I think uh, I really wish him well. I think this was the right time for the Seahawks to move on. I know that that a lot of those guys in the locker room don't feel the same way, um, and he was a big part of that locker room. And I don't think the players are necessarily going to be happy about this move. But um, from a football standpoint, I, like you said, I, I don't. Think it was a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. Yeah. I mean, had to make a move like this. Yeah. Um, last thing I'll say on this, and I'm curious like, if you feel any differently, but uh, when they made the trade for Jimmy Graham, I came out immediately against it. I was not a fan. And, and one of the reasons I was not a fan is because they traded uh, an offensive lineman for a skill position player. And there used to be a saying, it doesn't really apply as well anymore. In the NBA, you never trade a big for a little, for a big for a small. And that was, you know, you don't trade a center for a point guard or something along those lines, right? I felt that way about trading a lineman for a skill position because I think it it weakens your team. It weakens your core. And I have to be honest, I don't think that's really changed my mind since that trade happened. I think that trade, I know not everyone agrees with me and that's fine, but I think that trade really had a lot of repercussions that, you know, we've only now started to recover from as a team. This one is trading a small for a big. Um, you know, I'm curious if 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 that plays a role for you in evaluating this. If you know, if this had been a better receiver, if it had been in maybe a Tyler Lockett, um, and you're getting a Sheldon Richardson back, you know, would you think differently about this? Uh, I mean, it, this is why I love this because we keep talking about like we traded Jermaine Curse for Sheldon Richardson. We did not trade Jermaine Curse for, Curse for Sheldon Richardson. We traded a second round pick in Jermaine Curse for Sheldon Richardson. So I think it's kind of, I, I don't know if it really applies there really because the, the centerpiece of this trade is the second round pick. Um, now, yeah, I mean, if we were trading Tyler Lockett in a second round pick, that would, I would probably have a pretty strong opinion about that. I don't know. Uh, you might, maybe, maybe it's still the right thing to do, but. Uh, no, I mean, Jermaine Curse is a nice guy. He's a nice player. He's, a, I think he's a top three receiver on most teams in the NFL, but he is Jermaine Curse. So uh, I don't know how much that really factors into it. Yeah, it's it's interesting. And I know you've, you've said that before about this being for the second round pick. I think that that's almost entirely correct. Evidence to the contrary, though, is um, they – they could have picked other players. The Seahawks actually didn't need, I thought that the Seahawks needed to trade Jermaine Kirst because they needed that salary um, cap space in order to make this move. They didn't. Um, They had enough cap space to take on Sheldon Richardson after they restructured Doug Baldwin's contract. They didn't have to include Jermaine Kirst, but the Jets clearly wanted him. um, And they could have asked for other players. Um, Maybe they did. We won't, we won't know, but 
I do think that Jermaine Kirsch has value and and um, was part of what the Jets wanted in this deal, but we will never know. It's just I think he uh, hit a, a sweet spot, right, where he was valuable to the other team, but he didn't hurt so much that Seattle wouldn't give him up, and they didn't need to trade him for the cap reasons, but that didn't that didn't hurt, right? I mean, you are clearing that cap space, and you probably were going to cut him after this year, anyways. So I think he just kind of hit a sweet spot there more than anything. That's right. Well, so um, for those who have just joined, um, welcome. We'll be doing a live Q&A here in a little bit. We're going to go through a few more topics here with uh, Nathan and I, and then uh, we'll, we'll take some Q&A and, and finish up with some other topics um, going forward. So uh, next thing I wanted to ask you about was most surprising cut. And I think this relates because the logic was, all right, Jermaine Kirsch has been moved off the roster. Um, that now leaves space for Case and Williams. And that was, you know, or Tanner McAvoy or J.D. McKissick or whoever you thought was the bottom of the receiving um, bubble. Um, and it turns out he didn't make it. I I'm curious, was that your most surprising cut or was there someone else that surprised you more? I think in terms of cuts, yeah. Uh, Ruben was interesting, um, but, you know, he's older. Um, he had a cap hit. Uh, Quentin Jefferson was kind of interesting because he kind of flashed a little bit last year, but, you know, that's not a huge surprise. He's a fifth-round pick. Um, the only one that's close to me, uh, for me, and not because I particularly liked him, but I thought the team did, was uh, Marsh. Um, that was a trade, of course, and a pretty good one, it seemed like. Um, but in terms of just cuts, yeah, I think Kaysen, I mean, had to have been the biggest surprise. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I didn't see it coming at all. I mean, I, I, you look at it now, and, it, and you can kind of talk yourself into it, and you, you can look at ways that it kind of makes sense. But he just, I mean, he was unbelievable in the preseason, and... To see him go, yeah, easily a huge shock. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think everyone assumed after the first game that he made the team. I didn't assume he made the team after the first game. In fact, I came on the show and said I didn't assume that. I wrote about it. I said, hey, he's got to have, he's got to do it consistently, and he's got to make a play. He make plays on special teams. That was going to be a key factor. Well, second game, he had an amazing catch. He had a touchdown. He made plays on special teams, and at that point, I was like, all right, he's done enough. Third game against the Chiefs, he didn't get many targets. Um, some people are saying that that's why he's not with the team. I'm not sure that's the case. I, I, I think, you know, I, I can't claim he didn't get open. I just think he didn't get targets because they were going to some of the, the starters in that case. And the fourth game, I thought he played well again. I thought he, he caught, did some things other than just catching the deep ball. Um, he caught a pass over the middle. He caught a, a, a little comeback that he then did 15, 20 yards after the catch. So he showed a little run after the catch. Um, so I think he did everything possible to make this team and he didn't make it. And so the question, you know, becomes why? And, uh, uh, you know, my initial reaction, uh, I'm interested in your thoughts here. My initial reaction was not, hey, this was a terrible decision. I can't believe they didn't keep Case and Williams. My initial reaction was, this is uh, this really contradicts with their philosophy. Like, their words aren't matching their actions. That's an integrity thing. And I know that matters to the players. And <laughs> sure enough... Uh, you know, I was kind of trying to figure out the reasons and, uh, Sherm decided to chime in and, and say <laughs> exactly that it didn't make sense from his point of view. Um, he thought that he went out there and started talking specifically about, um, Amara Darbo and, and I think he was referencing him and, and that, uh, the tape showed that Kaysen was the better player. Um, What's your take on on that controversy? And and yeah, it was surprising. But but what's your take on on, on the controversy around this this decision? Uh, I mean, it makes sense to be mad about this. Uh, Kaysen played really well. Um, he's been here for three years, so he knows the system. Um, there are some Darbo fans, and that's great. That's fine. I get it. Uh, he's interesting, but. 
I just don't know how anyone can think that. I mean, we'll see too. I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't know how anyone can think that, that Darbo is going to be better than Case Williams this year. Um, but part of this is just a numbers game too, right? I mean, uh, I wrote up a, a piece on David Bass. I really liked him. I thought he was good. And then I started uh, putting together my own 53-man roster projections, and he was right on the bubble. And it was just because they had so many defensive linemen. And now they traded Marsh, and they cut uh, Jefferson, and they cut Ruben, so he ends up making it. Um, but with the wide receivers, they only go with five. Uh, they keep a spot for McKissick, um, probably because of some special teams value there with his ability to do returns. Um, they keep uh, uh, Tedrick Thompson. And, you know, for all the talk you, you want to have about keeping Darbo just because he's a third-round pick, like, why is Tedrick Thompson on this team? Um, and then they go 10, 10 uh, offensive linemen, and they make that trade for Isaiah Battle, which I kind of get. Uh, I don't mind them trying to find some offensive line talent and throwing some stuff against the board there. Um, but again, like I don't know if Isaiah Battle's really going to be a better player for this team than Kaysen would have been. So uh, there's a lot of different stuff that goes into this. Um, a lot of people wanted to make this about Tanner McAvoy. Uh, that one I didn't really get, both because I think Tanner McAvoy holds his own against Kaysen um, when you're just talking about, you know, contributions and pedigree and capability and all that and um, upside. Um, but it, it it's just hard to kind of understand. And Sherm didn't make it any easier to understand. Yeah. <laughs> one of the things about Darbo was that there was that report that the DB said the, the, the DB to put in a vote of confidence for him or whatever. Uh, and then so to, to see Sherm turn around and be like, Casey should have made this team. It makes it really confusing. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that played a role in Sherm feeling the need to speak up. Um, and I understand. I've heard a lot from a lot of folks that they feel like it was a, it was not the right choice, not the right way for, for Richard Sherman to voice his, his concerns or displeasure with the decision. Um, I think that's fair. Um, you know, knowing him, I, I know it comes from a good place and I know that he's thinking about Kaysen and I think he's thinking about integrity and he's thinking about the locker room and, you know, it does matter. It doesn't matter. Forget football. If you're in a job, any job, and your boss consistently is telling you that the best possible employee is going to get the promotion is going to, you know, be on the team and, and, you know, get paid and then some guy that's an MBA grad who everybody can tell just was you know he just got through the MBA program but he doesn't actually know what he's doing he's not great at it and there's someone else that works their tail off and just gets amazing results and the boss picks the MBA grad people are going to be annoyed like that mm -hmm. that actually affects the workplace and you know people want to say it's about hey you're the player you do what the coach says or you're the employee you do what the, the the boss says that's all true but we're people we're humans we want things to be fair we want to believe that the there's an equal uh opportunity for anybody to rise up it's kind of part of the american dream not to get on the soapbox but like you know if you get your foot in the door and you prove that you're the best then the expectation is you get rewarded. And, and I know it's not that simple. I know that, you know, I don't, I'm glad I am not in John Schneider's seat and his shoes having to make the decisions he makes. I know, I know, I've seen it in his eyes, how he agonizes over these things, even years later, um, how much this stuff really gets to him. He doesn't want to let a guy like Casey Williams go. And he's thinking about club control and he's thinking about three years down the line and he's thinking about Kaysen's age and he's thinking about Darbo, you know, on rookie year and his control and whether they can get him through waivers to practice, all that stuff factors in. And I get that. But if you're just a player on the team and you're not thinking about all those things, you're thinking about your team this year and your teammates. I absolutely understand why Richard Sherman feels as strongly about it as he does. Um, and people can debate it and people can, you know, call him out about it and that's fine. But um, I, I know that what he cares about is building the best possible team and, you know, having integrity along the way. And, and I think for the most part, he does that. Um, uh, maybe he needs to figure out some better ways to, to show it, but, but, uh, I mean, it's Richard Sherman, right? He's going to talk. This is what he does. <laughs> this is why we love him. He's going to talk. The thing that bummed me out about it is that it just like, 
we saw this relationship was strained in the offseason. We saw that they were openly talking about his requesting being traded and them being you know, willing to go along with it. And so I think coming up into another, you know, if you look at how this goes, I want Shrim to be here forever. Uh, and it doesn't really look like that's going to happen, which isn't a big surprise. It's kind of something we already knew, but, you know, it seems like this relationship with the team is strained. And so uh, he can talk. That doesn't bother me. Uh, I thought it was pretty cool, but uh, <laughs> it bums me out that this is probably not going to a good place. So be, you know, just between Sherman and the I'm team. Not, I'm not so sure about that. I, I think I think we all make more of that than, than the team does. Yes, they talk trade. Um, uh, you know, we'll see how that all plays out. But there was nobody who was more engaged with what was going on with the team during the preseason than Richard Sherman. Richard Sherman's the guy running out in the field when Blair Walsh makes the field goal and like cheering him on. He's the one that for every play that's being made in the fourth quarter is right there at the front of the sidelines cheering. He's the one going up to Pete Carroll and laughing about things. I think that relationship is actually really strong. I think that you know, he, he has some rough edges still um, that, that I think they got to work through. But, you know, we won't know. I would just offer, I don't think that it is uh, a sure thing or even close to a sure thing that, that we're seeing his last days here. So let, let, let's see how it goes. Um, they certainly don't have a replacement um, uh, for both corners if they maybe have one for one, which that brings me to the second cut, surprising for me. So if Casey Williams was the most surprising, I think that's pretty fair. Close second for me was Pierre Desir. Um, I, I really thought Pierre Desir did enough to make this team. I, I, I mentioned on Twitter, he was the number one rated corner across the NFL um, from Pro, Pro Football Focus um, in the preseason. Um, I think he has shown a lot. And, you know, at six foot two, I think he had a lot of things. And then DeAndre Elliott went down. So I really thought that they'd keep him. I thought that they would feel like, you know what? We've got enough special teams firepower elsewhere. We can let Nico Thorpe go. Um, and end of the day, it's clear. There's no way that they think Nico Thorpe's a better corner or a better long-term you know, option than, than this year. But um, I think they decided that Thorpe's special teams play was important enough to keep him. He led the team in ta- special teams tackles last year. What, do you have any thoughts of, about this year or about that decision? Why is Tedrick Thompson on this team? Like yeah. it, it's easy when these cuts happen to just look at the, you know, the cornerbacks and yeah, like him over Nico. I think with, when you know, on the last time I was on here, we talked about this too, that I would lean the guy that can play cornerback better. And I think Sorp, um, I thought he played okay. Um, I didn't only got to watch bits and pieces of that last game and I already had a rough one. Um, but overall I thought he, he did fine. Um, I thought this year was clearly better. Um, but it's not just about, you know, the cornerbacks, you know, Tedrick's on this team and uh again like there's a whole you know coaches see we see two percent coaches see 98 percent uh that two percent for tedrick was bad really bad uh and there's no like without the athleticism or anything there's not a lot of upside to look to so uh that's that gets me more than more than nico yeah it's interesting and and that kind of well, I mean, I'll mention one more piece here about surprise cuts. Uh, it wasn't a surprise to me at the end. It was a little bit surprising um, just because I, Pete sees quarterbacks differently than I do, um, but was cutting Trayvon Boykin. Um, after we talk about this, we're going to talk about most surprising keeps. You've made it clear that one of them is Tedrick Thompson. Um, but uh, I was pleased. I was pleased to see that they – went with the quarterback who won that role. Um, people say that Boykin started off way better and Davis came on at the end. That's not how I saw it. Davis was consistent through the whole preseason. Game one, he actually had a higher passer rating than Boykin. I tweeted that out that day. And nobody, you know, uh, CJ, if you're listening, he and I disagreed a little bit on Boykin after that first game. He's pretty excited about how he looked. I've never seen it. I've never really seen it with Boykin. I think he's a playmaker, but I think he's a riverboat gambler. And, you know, he looks a lot like Russell Wilson. He plays in some ways like him, but in the most important ways, which are like maturity, poise, decision-making, he is nothing like Russell Wilson. I don't think he will ever be anything like Russell Wilson. And it was no surprise to me that nobody claimed him. I, 
I don't know that he'll ever be on a roster. Um, maybe the Seahawks get him on a practice squad at some point. What was your thought on the quarterback battle? Yeah, that one mostly made sense. I was a little surprised just in that Davis is kind of, he's like the uber Matt Flynn kind of, uh, which, I mean, they did bring in Matt Flynn, but they've mostly gone away from that type of player, um, or they've quickly soured on that type of player. Um, and having a mobile quarterback as your backup, that offers some interesting stuff just because even if they're maybe not like as on it as your starter is, they can just curse themselves with their feet, which is um, I think what what Boykin was doing early when he was playing well in the preseason. Um, so that one just kind of made a lot of sense. Uh, it, it seemed like Davis was clearly better. Davis is a bad quarterback though. I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't want to like, we don't need to go down this hole, but like, uh, Colin Kaepernick is a million times better than Austin Davis. He is a similar type of quarterback as Russell Wilson. He should be on this team. He should be the backup. Um, he's not uh, for uh, pretty obvious reasons, and uh, so that's kind of water in the bridge. Uh, but it's it's not it's it's a bad decision, and uh, you're not going to win many games with Austin Davis. Probably not that you'd win many with Boykin either. But um, <laughs> well, yeah. I don't think it's water under the bridge with Kaepernick. Um, I, you know, I think it's played out in an ideal fashion for the Seahawks. Uh, the Seahawks, are, as far as I know, are the only team that brought him in for a tryout for a conversation. I think it's clear that Paul Allen is okay with him being on the team. He's, he's an owner that's not going to block it. I think Seattle as a, as an area is probably the, the other than San Francisco, one of the more liberal areas that, that could accept someone like him um, into the, the region. And I think that they don't need to spend money on him right now. Um, and they don't really need him as a backup um, on the roster. I think that they can, if there was a serious injury to Russell Wilson, which knock on wood, there isn't, um, he's going to be available. I don't think anyone else is going to sign him, and I think the Seahawks have the cap room to, to go get him when and if they need him. Otherwise, if it's a game or a quarter or something like that, then you go with Austin Davis and and you save yourself that distraction, and, and I think that – I think that makes sense to me. I 100% agree with you in your evaluation of the, the two players. I think Kaepernick's definitely the better backup, but no doubt there. Um, but I have no problems with the way they're handling it. Um, and in some ways, I think it's probably wise. So let's move on. Um, we're going to get to Q&A here in about five minutes or so. Um, uh, I want to talk about most surprising keeps. Um, and then after Q&A, we'll talk a little bit about some of the trades. Um, Cassius Marsh, Justin Coleman, Tremaine Brock, Isaiah Battle. Um, so most surprising keep for you. Uh, you've talked about Tedrick Thompson, so we know that. Um, we've talked about Nico Thorpe. Uh, were there other players that you were surprised that made the final roster? Yeah, I was not sure what they would do at fullback. Uh, and so keeping Trey Madden was a bit of a surprise. Um, I thought they might do maybe, maybe just go a week without a fullback and then bring Marcel Reese back. I didn't really think they'd go without a fullback, uh, but to see them just carry Madden um, outright was a little bit of a surprise. Um, they, they, it's kind of counterintuitive, but they have been a better running team when they don't have a fullback uh, out there. Um, although, Side is that I think that they use them well in the passing game. So uh, I think you can debate whether they should have a fullback uh, on the team. It's not a position that's going to get a ton of snaps. So how valuable that was is kind of questionable. Um, although maybe not really a surprise that they they went ahead and did it. Yeah, I, I would jump on there. I, that was one of the more surprising keeps to me for sure because there is zero chance Trey Madden's getting claimed. On waivers, I mean, you'd think, you yeah. absolutely, <laughs> you absolutely could put them on waivers. Uh, the implication there is they feel like they need a fullback because there's plays they want to run with a fullback on the roster, even for a week. My expectation, and and I hope I'm right, I really do, is that they're going to bring back Marcel Reese after week one to be their fullback, um, and I do think he brings some unique value, um, much more than I think Trey Madden does. Uh, but they don't want him to have a guaranteed contract. Um, week one, if you're if you're a veteran and you're on the roster, week one, you're guaranteed you know, your contract guaranteed, as you know. But I just thought they would go without a fullback for the first week, and if they did that, 
you could have kept a Casey Williams, you could have kept a Pierre Desir, you could have kept, you know, pick somebody else you liked. Uh, that was surprising to me. And if you hold on to one of those guys, either Casey or Pierre, maybe you're less likely to lose them on the week one cut than the the 90 to 53 cut down when everyone's, you know, looking and scouring this. So yeah, it was weird. I, I didn't have them carrying a fullback. Um, all that was more just my preference than what I thought they might do. Um, but I don't, I don't know that I, I really like the move. Yeah. And the other guys that I just call out here, um, uh, I was sweating it. I actually had a conversation. I interviewed uh, David Bass the day before cuts. Um, you wrote about him. I told you I've been high on him since really the first game. I, I've been watching him in training camp, and I, I saw glimpses. But every single game, I think he was easily the most consistent performer on defense through four games. And he did it against the rush. He did it against, you know, pass, ru pass rush. He did it against the run. He did it on the edge, and he did it inside. Pretty much did, and he did it on special teams as well. I mean, he did everything you could ask somebody to make the team. Um, I would argue he had a better preseason than even Case and Williams did for the Seahawks, and um, it was still questionable. It was questionable because Bass, you know, as much as he showed out, he's got limited athletic ability. He's, he even said to me, you know, that was a knock on him, you know, growing up, he's got a brother uh, who's more athletic than he is. And I'm um, in college right now, but um, I was really happy to see that he made it. I, you know, we can talk about this. Let's talk about this in relation to the Cassius Marsh trade before we open it up to questions. But um, everyone freaked out about Cassius Marsh getting traded. Initially we all heard it was for a seventh round pick. I'll be honest. I wasn't happy with that. I thought they'd get at least a sixth, um, but I was okay with it because I think Marcus Smith and David Bass both, I, I think David Bass is at least as good as Cassius Marsh and in terms of what he can offer this team. And I think Marcus Smith has a higher ceiling, could be a starting Leo down the road if, if he develops. So, I don't know your thoughts there. Once we found out, we also got a fifth round pick. In addition, I'll just throw out there before I throw it to you. Career sacks, Cassius Marsh, three. David Bass, five and a half. Marcus Smith, four. So I think everyone believes Cassius Marsh is on the come, but I think these other guys are too, and they've already done more than he has. The thing that made Marsh a little surprising to me, and – you know, when I first started with seventh round pick, I didn't bat an eye at that. Like uh, he, yeah. I mean, and and then when I heard that they were there was a fifth too, then I was blown away. I thought that was a fantastic deal. I, I don't, yeah, I, don't right. think, I, I don't really know what the Patriots were thinking there. Uh, uh, but what maybe what made it surprising to me is that he has some experience playing Sam for them, and I didn't know how that position was going to shake out. Uh, Garvin has played some Sam and, uh, he is not good against the run. Uh, he gets swallowed up and washed out and just pushed around. Um, Will Heights, Will Hoyt's played a little bit there. Um, I haven't watched a ton of them. He's looked okay. Uh, and he gives you some versatility as you know, I think he plays a little bit of teams, but so did Marsh and, uh, he plays other linebacker spots, but I just thought Marsh might get it, get that spot. Um, so they could kind of keep an extra defensive lineman and have someone that could play the Sam. Um, now, Marcus Smith plays linebacker too. Um, he was, you know, a rush backer in college. He's a defensive end now. He played uh, linebacker pretty poorly for the Eagles, but I think in a limited Sam type role, um, he fits that. So it's not a huge shock. Um, and again, you do still have Will Hoyt. Uh, but that Marshall, I, I, that was, I think that was fantastic. For all the talk about everything else, that might have been the best move of the day. Yeah. Oh, I mean, think what people don't realize. Marsh is on the last year of his deal. Um, and let me just check, double check his age here. 25, right? So he's still he's pretty young. He's last year of his deal, unrestricted free agent next year. I don't think he had a future with this team. I think he, he definitely was going to be valued more by another team than he was here. I think he's absolutely developing. I think his ceiling is a average to below average starter. Um, you know, if, if he gets eight sacks in a season, I think that would be his top, you know, I think that'd be fantastic if he has a year like that. Maybe he gets that opportunity in New England where they really don't have enough pass rush. But to turn a guy who is a rotational player, zero chance of starting, he wasn't, wasn't even like second in line to start. He was third or fourth in line to start 
if there was injury to take a player like that that's in the last year of his contract and get a seventh and fifth round pick in return and create the roster room to add guys like Marcus Smith and David Bass who actually could have a future with your team. Um, a genius. I mean, uh, maybe that's too strong of a word. Probably is. It's but, a small uh, move, but it was a good move. Like it was a really good move. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, um, we're going to start opening up to questions here. And for those of you that are um, Hawk Blogger patrons um, who are in the hangout, um, we're going to try doing using the chat pod for you guys to tell us you have a question. Then we will uh, call you on the stage and let you uh, jump in. So the way to do that, um, if you're on your uh, Hangout, is you should see, if you're on the desktop, hover over your screen, top left, you see a little chat. Click it open, um, and you should be able to have a group chat. Maybe if you're on your phone or something else, tap on it, see if you can find a little uh, chat icon, and let us know if you have a question. You guys are first up. If you have any questions, we will take yours first. If not, we'll go out to the folks on the live chat um, out in YouTube land. So Jeff, Kevin, Lance, uh, Nick, Tim, talking to you guys. If you have any questions, now's your chance. Um, uh, go ahead and open that chat pod and let us know. Um, not seeing anything so far. So I'm going to keep going and, and go to some of the questions we've got here. So uh, people that are on the live chat listening in, uh, live audience, if you have questions, feel free to enter them into the chat pod. I'm going to scroll all the way to talk because I think there was something early. Oh, so Kevin, I hear you. Let's uh, let's get you up on stage. And let's get you unmuted. Can you unmute yourself, Kevin? Go ahead. What's your question? Do you see the Seahawks keeping 10 offensive linemen for the whole season, or is that just a temporary thing? That's a great question. I, wh why don't you take a first stab at that, Nathan? I had them going nine. Um, and so uh, 10 was a little bit of a surprise. I don't think it's outside their norm, so it's certainly possible that they do. Uh, I I was a little surprised that Roos made it. Um, I just didn't think he looked very good. And uh, I don't know, does he have the versatility they tend to like? Um, and then Battle, I guess he ranked out really well by PFF. Um, uh, and offensive line is one place where I tend to trust PFF more than other places, which uh, so that's something. Um, but I would not be at all surprised to see this. I, I think there's a good chance that those two get churned and there'll be chances where, or there'll be stretches where maybe they carry nine, maybe they carry 10. Um, I would consider Bruce or battle lock battle either Bruce or battle locks. So, um, I think it'll fluctuate. Yeah, Kevin, I, I, I think it's a great question because I definitely, I had him at nine. Um, and I think Isaiah battle, you know, is a project, although I will mention that pro football, I tweeted this out pro football focus had like five linemen, five tackles that didn't give up a pressure, a sack or a hurry in preseason and Isaiah battle was one of them. <laughs> so, uh, he plays left tackle, he plays right tackle. He was a supplemental fifth round pick for the Rams. Didn't make that team. Um, I don't think he was going to make the chiefs. I agree with Nathan. I don't know if he'll stick around and they might use that, that roster spot on somebody else. Maybe this is like a glorified, glorified tryout, um, for a little while. Um, and if he doesn't make it, they'll, they won't lose that pick. Uh, I think Roos is around. I I've heard Pete talk about Jordan Roos. They see him as a long-term solution as part of that line. They're extremely excited about him. Um, he's a project. I, I don't think he's, I don't think he's ready to play by any stretch. So, uh, thanks for your question, Kevin. Uh, anyone else on, uh, uh, from on the patrons on the hangout are welcome to open the chat pod and let us know you have a question. We'll take yours. I've got a couple of viewer questions here. Um, so I'm going to go to this. Uh, so TJ, where was that? One more thing I'll add on the offensive line where you're looking at yeah, it. Go ahead. They have so much versatility. I mean, this is a cable line, so they all they all do everything and none of them do it well. But uh, uh, between Posick, uh, Tobin, and Glowinski, you know, Glowinski can play either guard spot. Uh, Tobin, I heard, that just played everywhere on the line. Um, and you know, obviously has a versatility in his background too that they really don't need to carry 10, it doesn't seem like. Uh, so 
kind of hope maybe they get that down to nine, although at this point, I mean, Kaysen's already gone, so <laughs> I wish they would have just kept Kaysen, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, I don't know, I lost TJ's question here, and you gave me plenty of time. So, someone's asking, uh, Komodo00 is asking, who's our strong side linebacker? You kind of talked about this a little bit, Nathan. Um, I actually think Will Hoyt is the strong side backer. Um, I think this is a guy that's been a starter for the 49ers for years. I think he's reliable. He's tough as nails. I think he's very strong against the run. He's a decent pass rusher as well when asked to be. Um, coverage is not probably his strong suit, but this is a guy that started in the league for a number of years. He is absolutely an upgrade over Mike Morgan as far as I'm concerned. So um, that's fine. I think Garvin's going to get a lot of snaps as well, though. I think they're very high on him. His speed, um, I think he's a playmaker. Um, and so I think his potential to make some plays, he's already recovered, you know, had a pick six, um, had some fumble recoveries. He just has that ability to be in the right place and, and his speed gets him into the right place. So I think he's an interesting player uh, as well. So I think both, I think they're in really good shape. I think there's the best linebacker depth they've had since they lost Malcolm Smith. Another guy that people don't talk about enough, and some people didn't have him making the team, but it was never a doubt to me, is Dewey McDonald. Dewey McDonald's a former safety, can back up at, I think, at least two of the linebacker spots, if not three, and was a monster this preseason. I thought he played really, really well. Um, and, uh, you know, he's been a great special teams player. I think he can be more than that if the, the team needs to call on him. Garvin's the guy they want to play Sam. He's the guy that started all throughout the preseason at that spot. Um, I have questions whether he can do it. And so maybe he has to split with Will Height. Just against the run, he was bad. Uh, Garvin was. And so uh, it's, the, bummer, the bummer thing about it, though, is that he was good in coverage, um, like legit good in coverage, um, not just backup good in coverage. So how that shakes out isn't super clear to me. Um, I think Garvin has to get better to be able to get out there on the field. But he's, from what I can tell, he's clearly the guy they, they want to take that job. All right, we've got a question from Terry. Um, Terry, if you can uh, unmute yourself, um, you can go ahead and ask us your question. Oh, he's got no mic. All right, Terry. Uh, so Terry's asking if we've talked about any of the improvement in special teams. Um, and feel free to you know add a little more specifics or details, Terry, if you want there. Um, What's your thought there um, uh, around whether this can be uh, an improved special teams compared to last year, Nathan? So I got killed on this for Twitter a little bit, but I'm not super comfortable with Blair Walsh yet. Uh, I know he's nine of 11. That's something like 82%, which is worse than what Hauschka was last year when everybody hated Hauschka. Uh, he also uh, had one miss that, called, that was called back on a, a penalty. And to his credit, he made the next kick, right? Uh, but you know he's nine of twelve. Uh, if you if you don't look at that erased uh, that erased kick, and that's seventy five percent, and that is what he kicked last year when he got cut. Um, I'm not panicking about it, but dude, you're totally panicking. I I'm see freaking the sweat out. No, uh, dripping down your forehead. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I. <laughs> I seriously, I got killed on for Twitter. I was shook. I didn't understand the blowback. People are all on the Blair Walsh train. Uh, but I, I count me count me out. Yeah, I, I'm not ready to get on yet. I'm a little nervous about it. Good because you know if too many get people get on one side of the boat, it tips over, dude. Okay. So I, I would say that that Blair Walsh. I, I'm a I'm a Blair Walsh believer, um, uh, and the main reason being that I loved the moxie this guy showed in the Vikings game. I I, I think his teammates did too, and the you know. Someone who's I've played sports never at a at a college or professional level, obviously, but I know the feeling of that competition, and I know what it feels like when you failed and you failed your teammates and you failed publicly, and everybody knows. And then you got to pick yourself back up. And the hardest part there is not that you don't you don't lose the skill; you still are just as skilled. This guy was a All Pro kicker. He was, you know, I think he was an All American in Georgia. I mean, this is a really really good kicker. But I was worried that he was going to be doubting himself and not have the confidence necessary to go there and do his job. And when he went in there and missed his first field goal against his team, hit the uprights, and then nailed two 52-yard field goals, which aren't gimmies, and he stared him down. I love that. The guy, you know, he weighs like 150 pounds soaking wet. So, like, if he's going to take those guys on, I got his back. I'm all over it. 
So, it was probably it was uh, maybe the best moment of the preseason for sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm just cautious still. I think that's fine. That's fine. We'll we'll uh, we'll balance it out and uh, we'll see where it ends up. Um, so Terry has a few more details. He's he's saying he's more concerned about the return game. He sees seems that it, if it wasn't for Lockett creating something, the blocking wasn't that good. And you know, as someone who's who's been really uh, a strong advocate of JD McKissick. I will say I'm really glad he made the team. I think people are, I wouldn't say they're vastly underestimating him. I think they are underestimating him. This is a second year player. He's got some special skills in space. He is very reliable as a returner. I think he brings some unique uh, ability for run after catch as a receiver. And I think he's, he's a different change of pace running back than they've got. None of the other backs run the way he runs. So I think he does a lot of stuff for them. But I don't think he's as good of a returner or anywhere close to as good of a returner as Lockett. Um, so I do think he's a step down. I think the blocking has to be better. But, Terry, I would say that from my point of view, special teams is going to get better and better and better because now you've got the same group working through those things. They're not, they're not sharing reps with the 90-man roster. Those guys are taking all of those reps. They're getting to know each other, getting to know their roles. Um, I think they're going to do really well. I think Cassius Marsh is a pretty big loss on special teams. Um, he was a huge contributor there. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that uh, evolves um, with him gone. What's your take on the the return game and and, and how that, that team's doing? Uh, Block is special, so losing him is going to hurt, and you're going to take a step down. Um, the, the one good thing is that the return game, um, you know, kickoff returns are such – that they're so – they're not what they used to be, right? When with the the new kickoff rules and everything, so what you lose there is pretty minimal. Um, and uh, I don't want to like set a low bar, but we've seen Richard Sherman out there returning punts. We've seen Earl Thomas out there returning punts. Uh, Brian Walters out there fair catching. Um, so it might not be great, um, but I don't think it's going to be um, a problem. Uh, this is a team that should be good enough to overcome. You know, any drop you have from Tyler Lockett to J.D. McKissick in the punt game. Um, it, it's it's a bummer that you might not have him out there. Um, we'll see what they end up doing with him. I, I don't I don't think you'll keep they'll keep him out of it. I don't think he'll keep himself out of it. I think you'll see Lockett out there returning punts at some point. Um, so I'm not too worried about it. But, yeah, it's, it's probably not going to be uh, – it, it's, it's probably going to be just okay at best, I think. Yeah, I, I don't know. It'll be a difference-making kind of part of their game. I think that's okay for, for the first week. I think um, McKissick did. I mean, he housed a, one of his first kicks back um, when he was with the Falcons in preseason. I mean, he's, he's got that ability. He just – I don't think it's come together yet. So um, we've got a question on uh, chat here. Um, got a lot of Brian Walters and Charlie Martin fans uh, <laughs> uh, back in the day. Um, question from Aiden O'Keefe, which is, uh, why didn't Jeremy Lane get moved? What's your take on that? Their quarterback depth situation is not great. Uh, like if you move Jeremy Lane, you're playing Justin Coleman as a nickel cornerback. And I'm not going to crap on Justin Coleman because I'd be lying if I told you I ever watched him, but that seems concerning to me. Um, so I, I don't, the, the talk of them trying to trade him was always kind of odd to me. I, I didn't know that they had a, they had the real, the depth and the ability to do that. Um, so I think he's important. I, I mean, in, this is a guy that had one bad year, right? Uh, it was just last year where he really took a step back. If I remember, if I remember right. Um, so uh, I wouldn't just count him out. I wouldn't just give him away. Um, and they can't afford to give him away. I don't think. Yeah, I was pretty surprised about the Tremaine Brock trade. Um, <laughs> not because I thought he played particularly well. I, I actually didn't. I was kind of concerned. And I just I, I kept telling myself it was rust and he'll get it back and he'll be fine when the game start or something. But his tackling wasn't great. His coverage wasn't great. And he was going against like third string quarterbacks and, and receivers. So I, <laughs> I don't think his performance was that great. But when they signed him, like this guy is a guy that played, you know, more snaps than any other cornerback last year. He's been, he's proven who he is in, in terms of a cornerback. 
Um, I was sure that meant that they would move on from Jeremy Lane, who had more salary and, you know, more durability concerns and honestly has not been the greatest uh, cover guy. I don't think he's great. I think he's okay at times. And, and while everyone else is worried about Shaq Griffin in this first game against uh, Aaron Rodgers, I worry more against guys like Randall Cobb against Jeremy Lane um, uh, in all honesty, but um, look, Rock played outside corner though, right? Like all last played, year, he's well, a boundary corner. He played both. And oh, did he? Hawks, he was playing nickel. Yeah. So yeah. it looked like yeah. they just gave him a run at nickel. And yeah, he kind of fell on his face against some third stringers out there. And so, you know, he's gone. Uh, I, I don't think there was a place for him on the outside. And when he couldn't play nickel, you know, they, they moved. I think that's right. I think that's right. And uh, uh, one of the things that, um, you know, I really thought that they would move Jeremy Lane to the Raiders. I thought that um, the Raiders desperately need a corner, a veteran corner. Uh, Reggie McKenzie connection down there in Oakland with John. Um, the fact that, that Ken Norton knows Jeremy Lane well, I just thought that was a clear move they could make. I think in the end of the day, they decided that Tremaine Brock was not the better player. They weren't getting good or they weren't getting good enough offers for Lane. And so in that case, um, you bring in, you know, you bring in uh, um, Lane and you get a Justin Coleman. Um, and really, I think they intended DeAndre Elliott to, to be on the roster. And it was a it was a crushing thing to see him have that injury in the fourth game. The guy really. Yeah, I was pulling for him, and he had made the team as far as I was concerned, I think, for them as well. So um, I think that caused him to scramble a little bit, and uh, we'll see. We'll see how that turns out. Uh, I know we just got a new person, Sham Patel, who uh, was on live chat and is now joined uh, as a patron. So welcome, Sham. Welcome. Um, we have a group chat open if uh, in the Hangouts, and you're welcome to, to put your question in there. And if you have one, we will uh, call you on stage. Um, so I've got a question from Fun Guy three four five, love the name. Uh, what is Shaquille Griffin's ceiling? Uh, all pro. I, he's uh, super talented uh, physically, and um, his college tape was all over the place. Uh, he certainly had bad moments, but I mean, he makes plays. He's athletic. Uh, he seems to be coming along quickly. I don't, uh, there's no reason to limit what you think Shaq or Quill can be. Um, I don't know what his realistic ceiling is. <laughs> uh, but I mean, he's in the perfect situation for his skill set. Um, and he's got a great skill set. So he could, he can go as far as he wants to, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I mean, let's talk about where he is right now. Um, because I, I always jump to potential. I mean, I, I agree with you. I, I think all pros maybe stretching it. I'm not, I think he's got that. I think Pro Bowl to me, I can say with a lot of confidence, I think he's mm -hmm. definitely got Pro Bowl potential. Um, but let's talk about where he is now. I, this is a guy who is going to be elite almost right away at covering deep balls, uh, the go route. Um, that's what Sherm is known for more than anything else in terms of he takes away the fade. Nobody can throw that on him. Um, and now I think the Seahawks can have two boundary corners who you're going to have a lot of trouble throwing the deep ball on. And so that right out of the gates, he's got, um, and it's not just cause he's fast. I mean, he covers like covers like his body proximity there. Um, really amazing how close he covers guys down the field. He also can, can, can close the gap. Um, if he loses, loses some ground. So, that's what he's going to do really well. What I think he's going to struggle with, he's going to struggle. Um, we've already seen it on some of the option routes where they're going to come come back. A guy like Stefan Diggs, who runs the whole route tree, who can break on a dime. Um, they're going to get – he's going to be cheating on the deep ball a little bit and probably will get taken advantage of on some of the underneath stuff for a while. Um, and even on the deep ball, he is not yet great at finding the ball. Uh, he, he doesn't get his head around. He, he's not yet ready to make those plays. When he does, he's going to be the leading, inter, you know, leading guy in terms of interceptions on this team. He's got great hands, super athlete. So I, I absolutely, I've said it before. I think this guy is going to be the best corner on the team within three years. And uh, I think that uh, 
he should absolutely be the starter week one. Uh, to me, no question. I think that he's going to take some bumps. I don't think, I think, well, let me put it this way. I might regret saying it. I hope Aaron Rodgers comes at him over and over and over again, because I think that's going to end up being a really good thing for him in the long run. Um, and I think he may disappoint the Packers a little bit if they keep doing that. I'm not talking Aaron Rodgers yet. Aaron Rodgers, don't <laughs> throw. Hand it off. Yep. So, um, so Sham wants to talk about uh, week one. A uh, little early for that, but Sham, you're, you're a patron, so you got it. Let me bring you on stage, and you can ask us your question about week one. Um, we will have another Real Hot Talk episode on uh, Tuesday night. Um, and we'll definitely be talking a lot about the Packer game there. But go ahead, Shem. Uh, if you can, uh, Sham, can you un unmute and let us know what your question is? <clears throat> well, you know, I live here in North Carolina. I got a huge buddy of mine who's a Green Bay Packer fan. He's got a mouth on him. And I think the Seahawks are going to go in there and um, I think they're going to go in there and put up 38-10 against them like we got beat last year. Wow. I really wow. do. Um, Sheldon Risson coming in there, a little pressure on Rodgers, throw him off his game. I think this sets the tone for the season, personally. And I'm super excited this year, and I can't wait. And I just have a special feeling for this year going in. I've been a Seahawks fan since 1983. Steve Lardner's my boy. Um, and I'm ready to rock and roll, and I love what you do here and raising money for good cause. Yeah, you know thanks, I mean? man. Um, well, let me ask you, before you put yourself back on mute, what, what does your buddy think? What, what's, what's he talking Oh, he always just said it's at Lambo, and we got Rogers. And I said, you know what? But it's it's September, not December, so a little bit of different ball game, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. So Anything you want to give a couple thoughts on uh, the Packers game? And we'll I think we got lucky this year. I know we're playing Green Bay again, and you know whatever on the road. I don't like that again, but at least this time it's week one and not you know week ten or twelve or thirteen. That's right. I think that's a very good point. Absolutely, Nathan. Yeah, everybody's going to hit me on these, like, uh, leading into whatever weak thoughts, uh, because I'm an eternal uh, pessimist, <laughs> uh, is how I, you know, you don't you don't get too excited and you, you can't get too let down. Uh, so I'm not uh, really confident in this game. I'm not, a, I'm not afraid, I guess, or I'm not um, worried. I think they've got a shot. Um, but it is Aaron Rodgers and it is Lambo, and they are not, that, that's not been their thing. Right. Um, and I don't know that I'm ready to, to, to say, you know, Hey, Aaron, go, go throw 10 balls at Quill. I don't know if I like how that's going to end. Uh, so I, I would lean green Bay on this. Um, but I, I don't think there's any reason to think that a 38 to 10 repeat is going to happen. Um, at least, at least for them. Yeah, I, I will uh, I will offer this. So everybody, hopefully most of you know, I, I do my tail of the tape on Wednesdays. Um, and so that's when I really break down the two teams and really decide for myself with more certainty who I think's got the edge and where the edge is. I was at the last, I was at Green Bay two years ago, I think it was, uh, maybe three years ago when they played the Packers. Um, it was early second week of the season. This was during the Cam holdout. Um, highly, first of all, highly recommend if you can get to the green Bay to watch a game, do it. Um, it's, it's a great environment going this time of year is great because it is warm and they've got great tailgating. You can just walk around from one tailgate to another and it's not even fans tailgates. It's, it's, they've got these beer gardens just from one to the other. It's all great stuff. So I uh, highly recommend going, but Seahawks absolutely can win. I, I don't doubt that. And I definitely think that the, the Sheldon Richardson move um gives them a much much better chance um, especially with the Packers having some question marks along their offensive line we'll see what happens with Bulaga if he's going to play I think he's probably will but he may not be 100% um and look I, I think the Green Bay defense is suspect so I, I think I think the Seahawks can absolutely go in there. I've been watching the the line on this game pretty closely cuz I keep seeing after the Sheldon move are they going to move the line They've been favoring the Packers by three points, which is basically Vegas saying they think this is a pick 'em game. And uh, Green Bay gets the three points because of home home field advantage. Um, I would not be surprised to see that go down to two or one um, before this game goes. goes. And uh, I think it's anyone's game. So uh, that's, that's what I'll give you for now. And uh, more to come on that.
thanks for joining. Really uh, happy to have another uh, another member. All right, so let's go. We got some other questions on here. Um, let's see. So while I'm looking for another question. Uh, uh, what's your What's your thought, Nathan, on um, what happens um, uh, in terms of the starting defensive line? Who is the Who's the guy that plays in place with Tabarun in base? Well, I don't think anybody's playing with Ruben. He's gone. No, who's playing for him? Oh, <laughs> thank you. That would be the question, dude. Uh, that makes more sense. Um, I'm probably gonna get myself in trouble with CJ here, but I would guess Reed. Um, I think it's kind of a toss up between the two. I know uh, Jones got the start in that Kansas City game, um, so maybe maybe lean Jones. Um, they're pretty similar, so I'm not. I wouldn't. I don't know that it matters all too much, but with Reed just being here for a year, I thought he played well last year. Um, he he ended up, ended up getting more runs to starters against Kansas City, um, and he is more of uh, – he's probably just a little stouter, I think, than Jones, just more of a straight one tech. Um, and so if you're looking for, you know, that, that run game support. Um, but the, the other thing is we're – you know, they're playing the Packers. So who starts game one is going to depend a lot on whether the Packers run out like three or four wide receivers, which they could do. And then maybe you see, maybe you see Jones out there. Maybe you see them get a little creative with it. Um, it could go a lot of ways, but I think uh, just talking about base downs, I think Reed is probably the guy who has the edge. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, Reed is, it was drafted as a guy that they think is one of the best run stuffing defensive tackles they've had. Uh, that they've dra- that they've scouted, they said. Um, I think he played well last year. I don't think he was much a, of a run stuffer as as Ruben has been. I, I do think this is an open question. A guy to watch, um, Cedric Thornton, was cut by the Cowboys today. Defensive tackle, a guy that the Seahawks were rumored to have some interest in. I'm not sure they had a visit with him, but they, they might have last year when he was a free agent. And uh, he's been a guy that's been a – near pro bowl level run stuffing defensive tackle um could be a really nice fit <laughs> i mean we're talking about the rich getting richer if you could have if you could have a base defensive line of michael bennett cedric thornton uh you know nas jones or jaron reed and then uh cliff averill and then go to a nickel defensive line of uh frank clark Sheldon Richardson. Sorry, I, said, <laughs> I can't believe base defensive line. I keep forgetting about Sheldon because I'm uh, it's so good. But base defensive line would be Michael Bennett, Cedric Thornton, Sheldon Richardson, and Cliff Averill. <laughs> you could do that, and then go to the nickel and bring in Frank Clark uh, and, and shift uh, Bennett inside. Um, wow, wow, that would be interesting. So, so watch, watch for him. I don't think they're necessarily done there. Um, It'll be interesting yeah, to see. I like Nas Jones. I, yeah. I mean, get a lot of play as well. And it'll be interesting to see just how much they want to play Sheldon on early downs. Do you want him out there on first down, you know, first and 10? Um, or do you want to put Jones and Reed out there and let Sheldon get a little rest, have a little extra, you know, burst when those passing down come, passing downs come? Maybe, maybe Sheldon's a, a second and third down player. Um, and which is great, right? And and do they really want to put them out there just to stuff a run? Well, yeah. I mean, people talk about that. Oh, they they're missing a defensive tackle. I don't know that I I agree. Um, they've kept eight defensive linemen for last year. They've averaged around eight and a half since 2010. Um, they've got Jaron Reed, Nas Jones, um, and uh, who's the other that I'm missing? That's it. I mean, Sheldon, but. Uh, Sheldon, and then they've also got David Bass and Michael Bennett that also play defensive tackle and can do that in nickel situations. They're obviously yeah. not going to play it in base, but they can do it in nickel. Um, they've kept three defensive tackles before. They'd like to keep four um, in terms of the true interior guys. So they'll probably add one more, and that could come at the cost of a, you know, uh, one of these guys at the very end of the roster that we've been talking about, maybe a J.D. McKissick. Um, once you know Lockett really comes back or 
um, maybe a Tedrick Thompson if they think that uh, they can stash him on the practice squad after a week, um, you know, after rosters have hardened a little bit. We'll, we'll kind of see. Um, let's see. So who been, we've got a question here from Ray K. Welcome to the show, Ray K. Uh, who benefits the most from the addition of Sheldon Richardson, Cliff, Bennett, or Frank Clark? Oh, man. Uh probably just cliff and uh yeah i'll just say cliff actually uh cliff is you know bennett can beat you in more ways than cliff can um bennett can be uh you know beat tackles inside and out cliff's more of just a pure outside rusher um there's so many times where cliff has just whooped a tackle um, to the outside and uh, the quarterback just takes a step up and, and Cliff gets nothing for it. Uh, and so now you've got Richardson in there and, and now that quarterback can't step up. Uh, so I, I think, I think Cliff actually pretty, pretty easily is the one that benefits the most. Yeah. I, I'll go just to be a uh, contrarian. I'll, I'll go with, um, I'll go with Michael Bennett because Bennett's the guy that absolutely has gotten the most attention. This is the guy that commands double teams, cause, <laughs> cause the most disruption. People that listen to the sideline video and audio of uh, Bill Belichick in the Super Bowl against the Seahawks was like, don't worry about anyone else. Block 72, he's killing us. Um, and that's the guy that everybody has to account for. And granted, I said that I, I was worried he's slowing down, and he might be. Let's assume he is. Doesn't mean he's terrible or he's bad. He's just maybe not, you know, borderline all pro anymore. Um, and to have Sheldon Richardson, who is going to demand some double teams, I think could breathe some new life into Michael Bennett. Um, and you know, it'd be really interesting to see the two of them on the inside working together. God help interior offensive lines. Um, and one of the things that uh, yes. He had one and a half sacks last year. I know people have talked about that, but if you look at the the advanced statistics on what Sheldon Richardson does in terms of pressures and QB hits, um, he creates a lot of disruption. And he also, people focus so much on the pass rush, which is great. This is an elite, like one of the top five in the game run stuffing um, defensive tackles. This is a guy who, you know, was second or I think third in the league in stuffs last year, which is tackles at or behind the line of scrimmage. So, um, you know, he's, he was had the same amount as Aaron Donald uh, last year. I mean, that, that's the type of, you know, run disruptive player he can be. So, um, you know, it's going to be just filthy um, how people are going to deal with this. Um, so we've got a question from Lance. Um, let's bring Lance on the stage here. And uh, Lance, you'll have to unmute yourself to ask, but go right ahead. Hey, Brian. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Okay, great. So my question deals with uh, the kind of unique skills that, um, that Pete tends to like in players. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, track star being an example of that. I um, can't remember his name off the top of my head. Cyril Grayson. Yeah, Cyril sure, Grayson didn't make the team, but of those players that were kind of on the bubble and did make the team, which of them do you think has that kind of unique athletic skill that uh, Pete tends to uh, set aside and put special value on? What's your thought there, Nathan? Yeah, this is kind of a cool question. Uh, uh, I think when you're talking athletic skill, the first guy you have to go to is Tedrick Thompson. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I Tanner don't McAvoy. Not watching, man. You're, you're <laughs> wearing him out tonight. He uh, should not be on the football team. Uh, Tanner McAvoy is the guy, though. Uh, he's six foot six. Um, he tested well. Um, he uh, he has. Uh, I was talking to Jared Stinger about this uh, on Twitter, um, and and Jared was making the point that you know uh, everyone's saying Tanner made it over. Uh, uh, Kaysen on special teams, and but Kaysen had uh, more special teams tackles, and he had the big one on that. I think the second game. But what Tanner does, uh, Tanner's asked to to try to just block punts, basically, and he is going to block a punt this year. I would I would bet money on it. He is so big and so long and so fast. Uh, 
it's just like every punt, if you watch him, it looks like he's going to get it. And he's close all the time. And so just from a height weight speed perspective, I think he's really unique and interesting. Um, and then from a skill perspective, his ability to try to get after a punt and block it uh, is really cool. Yeah, this is a tough question because honestly, I don't know that there's as many, I, I think Tanner's a, a really good one as an example. I don't know that there's as many of those kind of players like, you know, in the past you've been able to look at a, an Earl Thomas who, you know, sideline to sideline speed is, you know, uh, unmatched uh, or a Cam Chancellor who, you know, was the, the toughest player, the man on the field. Um, they kind of had these unique KJ Wright, who you know, his wingspan and his length at linebacker was super unique. Bobby Wagner's speed was super unique. I don't know that they have a guy that really jumps out to me in the same way as, as some of those players do. Um, I, I think you know the the one that kind of comes to mind is CJ Procise. Uh, I think his skills as a receiver and. I will just say, I'm going to go on a soapbox for a second here, which is a place I like to get. So I think people are used to it by now. But um, look, this guy's a third round pick last year, and he exceeded my expectations of how good he was when he was on the field. He made impact plays every single game. Now, I know there wasn't a lot of them, but the ones he was in, he made impact plays, and he didn't just make them against the Cleveland Browns. He made them in New Orleans, he made them in New England. Um, and I would say that the Seahawks maybe don't win that game in New England if C.J. Procise isn't their starting tailback in that game. Um, so he's a guy, Lance, that he can run receiver routes. He uh, can run along the edge uh, as a running back. I think that he actually showed me more as uh, a power runner than I would have expected. He's, he's tougher than I would have expected. So I, I think he's a guy that's pretty unique. And the question is just going to be durability. Uh, and, and I think that he's going to have to shake that, but, um, I'm really interested to see if he can do that. Yeah, I think, um, I kind of agree with Nathan a bit. I was thinking about Tanner McAvoy just because, you know, he got picked over Casey Williams and I was thinking, well, in some respects, Tanner has a more unique skill set. Maybe it's not as mature yet, but to me, Casey still seems like a lot of other receivers in the NFL, and McAvoy looked like he could be different, and I think that might have appealed to the, the team when they finally got down to who they kept and who they let go. I think you might be right. It's a good question. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being a patron, and thanks for your question, Lance. Uh, so we've got a few more questions here. Um, so we've got a question here from um, – Sean Proper, uh, whether we're surprised that there's been zero news about Malik McDowell's condition. I'll start by just saying I, I'm not that surprised. Uh, I think that the team, Pete's been pretty clear. He said we're not going to hear for weeks, and it hasn't been that many weeks yet. Uh, I hope no one's waiting on pins and needles. As far as I'm concerned, this guy's definitely not going to play this year, and I think when Mike Garofalo came on with us last week, his comment was, you know, the optimistic thing is that it's up in the air, <laughs> you know, uh, that he'll ever play. Um, and, and so that's kind of where it is in my head. I'm not, I'm not assuming he's ever going to play for this team. Um, so I'm just not waiting for news. How about you? It's weird to me just because I don't know why they aren't releasing it. I know that they said he requested it, the family requested it or whatever, but and I guess maybe just because it's not a football injury that, that that makes it different somehow. But we tend to know a lot about these guys' health and where they are in processes. I mean, we know about that. Uh, I don't remember what, what it was called now, but whatever KJ went and had done um, over in Europe and then a few other players went. And so we tend to know a lot about this stuff. And so to have this be so uh, in the dark is weird. Um, it also doesn't see, it seems counterproductive to me because now you just have a ton of people speculating about what's going on with him. And I don't know if that's great. Uh, apparently they don't care. Um, so it is weird to me. Um, but I, I'm kind of, I've kind of taken the same approach as, as you like, I, I think he's done for the year. Um, and uh, I think maybe just trying to, uh, I don't know. I, I think putting any hopes on him is probably not the smartest. Yeah. 
Um, so we're winding down here in the last five minutes, I'd say or so. And um, uh, one of the things I want to point out, and I, I made this point on Twitter, I, I've looked at every single cut John Schneider has made since 2010. Um, haven't had a chance to write it up. Don't know if I will have time because my attention's going to really quickly turn to uh, the Packers game. But um, look, this guy, for all the hand wringing we do about you know the very end of this roster very, very, very few of the players that he's let go that have come back to like haunt is even too strong of a word. The guys that are out there that, that qualify would be Spencer Ware who's become a starting running back for the the chiefs. Um, this is a guy that had two DUIs. Uh, there was reasons the team let him go. Um, I think they had a lot of other guys they, they felt comfortable with. You had Jay Howard, who I think was probably the best when he was playing at, his peak level was the best player that they've let go. Um, that guy was a borderline pro bowler um, and uh, unfortunately fallen on hard times health wise. You've got Ron Parker, who's definitely a very good player. Um, you've got Will Blackman, who's been a starter for a lot of not very good teams, not a great corner, but a decent one. And then someone brought up Terrell Pryor, who I think is fair to bring up because he's, he's turned into something, but the Seahawks, Absolutely, we're interested in him as more than a quarterback, but Pryor was not interested in being more than a quarterback when he was with the Seahawks. So I think you can only really evaluate him as a quarterback here. Once he realized he wasn't going to catch on, he started being willing to do things like receiver, and, and that's why his career blossomed. So I, I just think it's important to, to, to point out that, that Schneider generally does the right thing here um, one way or another. Yeah, and I think it's more than fair to to criticize, you know, moves like Kaysen and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, it's why we're fans for one. But I mean, this stuff doesn't matter. Like, you know, whether you keep a Jay Howard or a Spencer War Ware, that that doesn't matter. Um, but it's important too. I mean, like the fifty three, the cut to fifty three, like inverts our perspective, and we're looking at Amara Darbo and Tedrick Thompson and Kaysen Williams and Isaiah Battle, and not. Russell Wilson and Doug Baldwin and Bobby Wagner and Earl Thomas and Michael Bennett and Sheldon Richardson and on and on and on. This is an incredibly stacked team. And so I am suspicious that we're going to be sad about the case and cut, um, but it's not likely to make a significant difference on this team. Um, so it, it was a fun day kind of, uh, <laughs> but I'm kind of glad it's behind us. Yeah. Yeah. It's been busy. I mean, I'll just wrap up by saying uh, like, I think the Sheldon move is going to be, um, I think it's a season changer. There's no doubt about it in my mind. I, I think that the Seahawks went from a team who I was feeling very positive about. Um, I think that they've got, they've got a chemistry right now. I think their offense is ready to play its best season, even though the offensive line's a question mark. I think, Russell and his skill players are ready to step forward. Um, I think that the offensive line will be better than the absolute worst it was last year. Um, and that's, they already were good enough to beat the Falcons and the Patriots and, and things like that. I think that uh, the defense looks locked in and, and playing on a string connected like they have uh, maybe not for a couple of years. And now they have depth that, that they haven't had. And now you add a guy like Sheldon Richardson, he, he's just the power ball. Like he takes it from being, you know, the, the million dollar jackpot to the hundred million. He just, he just seems like a guy that could absolutely make the Seahawks an impossible team to play. And the thing that I like best about it is it gets the Seahawks back to being the bullies. This is the team that used to walk off the bus and everybody feared playing them. This was the team that when you played them one week, you lost the next week. And it wasn't because, you know, you were down. It was because you were beaten. Even when you beat the Seahawks, you lost the next week. So I think they're very close to getting back to that style of play, pound the run, um, you know, Russell passing, breaking their hearts, uh, and this defense just crushing souls. So I, I think this is a, a fantastic time to be a Seahawks fan. Um, Highly recommend, uh, you know, going out there and uh, getting your gear. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've got uh, these beauties here. Got to show these off. My new little Seahawks sneakers. Look at that. 
Ah, oh, you know you I'm want probably going to pick those up like today. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's going to be a great season, and uh, I want to thank everybody. Make sure you click subscribe um, uh, on the YouTube channel. We're going to have a bunch of stuff Tuesday night. We're going to have our preview podcast talking about the Packers game, really getting into depth on that. We'll have a preview of the tail of the tape because I'll have some of the information by then. Um, hopefully we'll have more of the guys around. We may have a guest. Um, and, uh, if you aren't already join Patreon, uh, Hawk blogger as a subscriber, um, bunch of access that we'll give you. We're giving uh, pro football focus, um, access I, as part of Patreon. Um, people that are subscribers can get the top 10 bottom 10, um, players for the Seahawks every week. Um, no one else gets that. Um, so patreon.com p a t r e o n.com slash hawk blogger sign up there um and then also i just want to go back and and thank our our sponsor again um we had uh, uh john hurlbutt and altitude homes altitude dash re.com slash hb they will donate 500 dollars for every closed transaction they serve um you know south king and and uh Pierce and Thurston counties, uh, really great real estate folks for selling, buying, investing, anything you want to do. It's a great time to get into real estate. So John Hurlbutt's your guy, go there, um, check them out. And, uh, Nathan, thank you. And go Hawks. Yeah, go Hawks.